Director Nick Castle is one of those unique filmmakers who is hardly talked about. If I search on Google for interviews with Castle, all I really could find were interviews of his work playing the killer, Michael Myers, on the classic slasher horror film, Halloween. Nick Castle is also known for his work as an award-winning screenwriter and co-writer for John Carpenter on films like Escape from New York. He would even write for films like Hook for Steven Spielberg. Not only that, but he has served as cinematographer on the Academy Award-winning live-action short film The Resurrection of Bronco Billy. Castle came from an entertainment background, as his father was a tap-dancing choreographer for motion pictures, television and the stage. Nick Castle would even appear as an extra in his father's films. In tribute to his father's work as a tap-dancing choreographer, he would direct and write the film Tap, starring Gregory Hines. As an actor, his other film credits included playing an alien beach ball in Carpenter's debut film, Dark Star. More recently, he would reprise his role of Michael Myers in the 2018 movie, Halloween. He has had a long-standing close friendship and working relationship with director John Carpenter since his film school days at USC, even playing in a band together with Carpenter called the Coupe de Villes, who would perform the title song for Carpenter's film, Big Trouble in Little China. Castle's name was even used for one of the characters in John Carpenter's The Fog. But what I truly know Nick Castle for is his tremendous work as a director on wonderful films like The Last Starfighter and The Boy Who Could Fly, two of my favorite movies of the 1980s. In the 1990s, he would direct comedies like Major Pain and Dennis the Menace. Not my favorites, but fun little films. To me though, he is potentially one of the most underrated directors in film. During the 1980s, after his success directing films like The Last Starfighter in 1984, which was one of the first films that used CGI and influenced the way special effects films were made, Castle would follow this with the wonderfully sweet sentimental fantasy drama which he would direct and write called The Boy Could Fly in 1986 which was a very loose adaptation from the classic J.M. Barry story of Peter Pan. Lucy Deakins stars as Millie, who moves into a new house with her brother, Lewis, played by Fred Savage, and her mother, played by Bonnie Bedelia, after the tragic loss of their father to suicide. Millie befriends a young teenage boy, Eric, played by Jay Underwood, who lives next door with his alcoholic uncle, Hugo, played by Fred Gwim. The authorities believe Eric may be autistic. When Eric was five, he lost his parents tragically in a plane crash. Ever since then, he hasn't spoken a word. All he does most days is sit on the windowsill with his arms spread out like a plane, dreaming that he can fly. Uncle Hugo swears Eric can fly, but no one believes him. With the guidance of special needs teacher, Mrs. Sherman, played wonderfully by Colleen Dewhurst. Millie is asked to help Eric and tries to communicate with Eric. Eventually, she develops a close bond with Eric. After a series of events, Millie starts to believe that maybe Eric can fly. Lucy Deakins was perfectly cast as Millie, the girl who reaches out to Eric. And Deakins was originally seen in the soap as the world turns. Her other film roles include the Great Outdoors in 1988 with John Candy and Dan Aykroyd. When you first heard about the script or the first time that you knew anything about it, uh, what was your reaction? Well, the first thing I ever heard about it, I was um, actually at an audition and I was reading sides and I had no idea what was going on. Um, I hadn't seen the full script. I saw, I think, two scenes from it and I didn't, they were talking about Eric and I didn't know anything about it. Um, then when I read the script, um, which was about, I guess, a couple of weeks later, I loved it um, because I went through the whole script without hearing anybody talk about it first. It was just wonderful. As an actress working with an actor who is portraying someone who doesn't speak, now what was that like for you? It was very difficult. Um, we had to, we worked a lot uh, together, Jay and I in character, um, to get used to the way someone would respond to somebody who didn't not even 
didn't talk but didn't react in a, a normal way, uh, the way you, you're used to. Um, we went to a couple of malls, uh, the director and Jay and I, and we'd both be in character. And people would just stare at us and they thought we were crazy. Jay would stand in front of this little tiny toy plane that was for like four-year-old children um, to get in and ride on. And he tried to get into it and he's a five foot ten, 120 pounds or whatever. And people thought we were crazy. Um, and I had to try and get him away and it was, it was very interesting. Jay Underwood was cast as Eric. What is he like really? Is he a, a quiet boy or what is he like? He talks so much, it's not even funny. Um, he's really wonderful, but he's, he does talk a lot. So that was some kind of discipline for him, <laughs> wasn't it? Yes, it was. I think he really enjoyed it. Um, it's a chance to do something that, well, not many actors do. Um, that's not something that's very often written. And I think he really had a good time with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. Uh, the Boy Good Fly came up and, and um, yeah, it was made by, uh, uh, you know, a, a major studio at the time and, and, uh, and came out and, you know, I think it did okay. It certainly has had a, a great life, you know, uh, with video and DVD and all that. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the kind of unique thing there was, you know, I'm playing the title character and he's autistic and doesn't speak in the movie. I had six words in the whole film. And uh, so it was, I mean, it was a real different kind of part to play and, and certainly a great challenge. And, I, you know, for a young actor of 16, uh, 15, you know, making a, a movie like that, it, I mean, it's just, you feel like you're on top of the world. It's just, it was just the best. <laughs> and I just, just a great time. Underwood played a number of roles starting in the 1980s as Chip Carson in the Disney TV movie, Not Quite Human. Films like The Invisible Kid and playing the sleazy teenager, Bug, in Uncle Buck. He even played Sonny Bono in the TV movie, The Sonny and Cher Story, before starring in the first live action Fantastic Four film in 1994, playing the Human Torch. The film since then has become a cult hit and was never released officially, and a documentary about the film was also made. Colleen Dewhurst has been seen in a number of films, including Ice Castles and the Anne of Green Gables miniseries, in 1985. In The Boy Who Could Fly, she plays Mrs. Sherman. Others to be cast were Bonnie Bedelia as Millie's mother. She, of course, would go on to star in Die Hard in 1988. Fred Savage makes his film debut, playing Lewis, Millie's brother. Savage is, of course, known to us for playing Kevin in the highly successful Emmy Award-winning coming-of-age series, The Wonder Years. Mindy Cohn plays Geneva, the next door neighbor who befriends Millie. Mindy Cohn is best known for starring in the hit 1980s sitcom, The Facts of Life. Louise Fletcher has a small role as Dr. Granada. Director Nick Castle makes a small cameo in the film, along with his fellow director buddies, John Carpenter and Tommy Lee Wallace, as the Coupe de Villes, the band featured in the video Millie and Geneva are watching while they are getting drunk on margaritas. The song they are performing on the video is an original song by the band called Back on the Bus. Director Castle cited the 1941 Disney animated classic Dumbo as one of the main inspirations for The Boy Who Could Fly. In one scene in the film, we see Fred Savage playing the last Starfighter video game, which of course was a film directed by Castle. Now you also had to fly or be flown, maybe I should <laughs> say, in this. It was very different from anything I'd ever done before. Being hung from two wires was uh, not something that most people do very often. Um, it was hard. It was a lot of hard work. Um, you have to be very physically fit. Uh, you have to basically hold yourself in the position um, horizontally like that. And I wasn't in shape at the beginning of the summer, but I was when we finished. The whole uh, last month, the month in uh, LA, we did the dream sequence. And then we did about I'm trying to remember, two to three weeks um, of the carnival in Vancouver, and we did a couple of days before that, but we rehearsed from the very beginning. We rehearsed before we started shooting. We were actually up flying. It's very different from doing the, the blue screen work that was done in L.A. because it's actually, there are people down there reacting to what you're doing, and it, it's real. It's live. Um, I think it's more fun. The, the blue screen stuff, there's nothing there, and it's really kind of boring. You just sit there for four hours doing the exact same thing, and you don't, you don't know what's going to happen behind you. The Boy Could Fly was produced by Lorimar Productions for 20th Century Fox and released in theatres on August the 15th 
of 1986. The film was a moderate success at the box office. Nick Castle would go on to win the Saturn Award for Best Writing. Bruce Broughton composes and conducts a wonderfully sweet score for the film. The song Back of the Bus, performed by the Coupe de Villes, was in fact written by screenwriter Nick Castle and Bruce Broughton. The film was also successful on video and released through CBS Fox Video. There was even a warning just before the film started, with a voiceover saying, The boy who could fly, the scenes that include flying in this film, are performed by professional stunt artists, observing special safety rules under strict supervision. Do not in any way attempt to imitate any of the stunts performed. The Boy Could Fly is a wonderful, sweet story without coming across as overly sentimental and corny. The film is really a true-to-life portrayal of teenage heartbreak, which never patronises or insults the intelligence of the young audience that this film is clearly aimed at. The film is quite deep for a family fantasy drama, which explores family tragedies like suicide and also explores the grieving process. It expresses this through Millie and a young brother, Lewis. The film even looks at autism. It doesn't mention it, but certainly looks at this subject. Autism at this time was not really an issue that was discussed, explored, or known about during the 1980s. Each actor in this film does an amazing job and all bring out believable performances. The Boy Who Could Fly has an extremely positive message that is not really seen in today's movies. It's such a rarity these days, and the film tells us that even through heartbreak and tragedy, we can prevail, and that if you believe and have faith, anything is possible. Seems overly optimistic in today's climate, but I think it's needed. My name's Jonathan. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like what you see on my channel, please subscribe. And if you would like to become a patron on my Patreon, click on the link below.